Okay, so um, my name is Rona Waldenberg. Uh, I am the Associate Dean for Admission at the Zucker uh, School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell, and I'm also a radiologist, actually a neuroradiologist. So I was interested in uh, seeing uh, and hearing the end of Dr. Harrell's talk. I do uh, interpret some imaging from him, and um, that's a, another uh, integration between uh, neurology, neuroimaging, and obviously neurosurgery, a, a group of us um, all work together uh, in this vast world of uh, neurologic diagnoses. But uh, that's the hat that I'm going to wear in about uh, an hour or two from now when I log on and uh, work as a neuroradiologist. But right now, I'm working for you, and that is um, as an admissions officer at the School of Medicine. Um, what we try to do in this talk is um, update a little bit uh, some of the information. I have given uh, the talk about uh, general admissions to uh, the brain turns, and what we did was we updated it uh, to include some information uh, relative to uh, where we stand now, what's changed in the application process um, over the past year, and primarily as a result of COVID and how it has impacted the admissions process. So the, here are the stats actually from the current MS1 going to be MS2 class. So our first year incoming class is going to start uh, the first week in August. So these stats relate to that current first year that are going up to be second year class. And you can see um, the uh, huge amount of work that goes into applying to medical school on the end of the AAMC and uh, AMCAS. And um, in the cycle that involved the current MS1 now going to MS2 class, there were 51,000 applicants uh, of which about 40% are accepted and a very similar number enroll. Um, you can see the GPAs of applicants versus enrollees. You see the um, average MCAT score here of the uh, enrolled group, and you can see um, the breakdown in terms of race and ethnicity of the different groups that are applying to medical school. Still um, dominant is white Caucasian, but obviously a large percentage of um, Asians are applying, as well as people who identify as mixed race, Black and Hispanic, and so on and so on. Um, just to give you an idea, um, average number of um, courses taken, average number of research lab hours, and uh, community service hours all included here as well. And again, these are students who um, ended up um, and are currently in the now going to be rising MS2 class. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a breakdown of what's important. So, uh, GPA and MCAT obviously um, are very, um, very uh, appropriate and important. Now with COVID, uh, there was a slight change and I'll go over that a little bit, but still um, the vast majority of the students, um, even throughout COVID, uh, were able to take the MCAT. Many of you are aware if you have taken the MCAT already that they divide, they shorten the exam they divided it such that there were allowed to be three uh, exam sittings in one day. So as to allow as many uh, people as possible to take the exam. So fortunately or unfortunately, but the MCAT is not going away. Uh, it has since been restored back to what is the quote unquote normal length of the exam uh, with the normal sittings um, as was done prior to COVID. But uh, MCAT is very much a part and parcel of the process, as is the GPA. Um, experiences, obviously, in healthcare, we'll talk a little bit about that and how potentially to tackle that um, in um, the COVID environment. I, I highlight um, the experience with underserved populations. Uh, many of you um, may be from an underserved population, but from those of you who are not, getting involved with underserved populations, understanding the social determinants of health are really primary now, um, especially uh, in the past year, given 
how COVID has highlighted uh, the healthcare disparities and our populations at risk in this country. Really, COVID was a magnifying glass for all of the difficulties that um, are, are a part of our healthcare system and all of the challenges, and they just magnified, COVID just magnified those challenges, but in doing so, I think, uh, gave us somewhat of a, um, of, of, of an understanding of, of really what's primary. Um, a lot of schools, just be aware for those of you who are not US citizens, do require US citizenships. Schools will also give you information about whether they accept DACA students, uh, for any of you who may potentially be in that category. Um, and when it says parentheses P, that means that that's a state school. Uh, and uh, so those are the state schools that um, are weighing these particular things more than others. And private, meaning the private medical schools such as ours, where uh, our research experience, medium importance in the private medical school, um, whereas your background uh, in public school, a, a state school environment uh, may be more important. Um, however, interesting, they have first generation college student, and this is from the AAMC, but we value first generation status as well. So I don't know if I would necessarily say for a private school, it's not as important. Uh, I do think um, it's important uh, for us as well, though it doesn't say the pub private. So uh, the demographic is, is important for all of us. Again, the U.S. citizenship for us is important, and then you know lowest importance. And um, again, um, some schools potentially research, not research again, um, and you know some of the other things here. So just to keep your uh, keep these things on your radar when you're when you're going forward and sort of constructing your application. Okay. Um, just to, again, give you a little bit of an idea of the trends over the past 10 years and understand that the last column here on your right is for, again, last year's cycle. And I'm going to give you some of the numbers from the most immediate cycle that we're just concluding right now. And you can see that over uh, the 10 years from 2011-12 to 2020-2021, Basically, um, there was a gradual about a 10,000 increase in the applications to medical school, yet the number of spots basically available only increased by about um, 3,000. So uh, increased number of applicants for a smaller uh, number of spots uh, over time into the medical school environment, and it's only gotten more competitive over this past year. Um, you look here, and the reason why I show you this slide, it's very confusing, but it's a graph that allows you to sort of look at um, um, GPA and MCAT and link them together to see sort of um, how many um, of those applicants get into medical school. And if you look at the percentage rate, you look at those students who potentially have the highest MCAT and the highest GPA, and yet about 13% of those students don't get into medical school, right? Now, the reasons for that um, are, are several, one of which is um, there's some uh, major, um, uh, what we call investigation or institutional action in the background. Um, understand that our applications that we receive are filled with alcohol <laughs> violations. Um, we have an understanding that students do go to medical school, uh, do go to medical school, sorry about that, do go to college. Many, it's first time away from home. Um, and we do appreciate that sometimes there are those growing up experiences. So in general, though not always, and I can't speak for other schools, uh, one violation uh, where it didn't result in any harm uh, to the person or to others is not really held that much against an applicant. We like you to be wise. We like you to be aware of what your school's policies are and to adhere to those, but um, we can forgive a mistake. Um, if you have more than one mistake, uh, then it starts to get a little bit more complicated for you as you uh, should have learned your lesson from the first time. And so we're 
less forgiving, obviously, as those violations pile up. We also understand that different schools have different policies with regard to the alcohol violations. However, the violations that involve any sort of ethical breach, cheating, plagiarism, any form of misconduct, um, those um, are, are taken much more seriously. So in this grouping of the 13%, uh, you may find students who may be extraordinarily bright, big GPAs, big MCATs, but have something on their record that has kept them out of medical school or potentially will keep them out. Uh, because given the fact that, as you see, the number of applicants to medical school is so large, um, we like to look at everybody and, and understand their story, but um, those things can be held against you in, in, an, in a very um, competitive environment. The other thing is interview, right? So medical school is one of the only, is the only professional school, if you look at business school and law school, that requires an interview. So many students who can be particularly bright don't interview well. And though the numbers may get them to the point of getting the interview, when they arrive at the interview, uh, they fall short. So we'll give you a little bit of strategies about interview on the backside, because they are obviously critical uh, in the medical school admissions process, because in, in a world where there are so many qualified applicants, that interview is going to make the difference. So again, uh, just to review, and this was on that initial slide, but looking at the average or uh, the mean MCAT of the applicant pool, which was about 506, and now in the prior, again, matriculated pool um, considerably higher in terms of what was the actual matriculant number. Uh, that number's dropped a little bit back down this uh, past cycle. So that's good news um, in terms of the average uh, MCAT for the matriculant pool. It's, it's currently about 508, whereas in the previous, it was up to 511 in terms of the matriculants. Now, in this, just this cycle that we're completing at this moment, uh, we, we are done and our students should be walking in the door in about two weeks. Um, the applicant numbers are way up. Um, national number, I think I showed you from the previous cycle was 51,000 up um, not, uh, to 60,000 with an increase of 18% and our numbers um, up, um, up to 25% over the previous cycle. So. Um, I'm becoming a, a doctor and getting into medical school is definitely becoming a little bit more competitive. Um, just to go back and we'll give you a little bit, I'm gonna give you a little bit of the reasons for why we think this has occurred um, a little bit later in the talk, but there are definitely some reasons behind this. And it isn't, it is the Fauci effect that you may have heard of in, in the general news and it isn't. The reason why it isn't is that all of you who have any interest in medicine know you don't wake up one day and say, oh, I'm going to be a doctor. Let me apply tomorrow. Uh, preparing to apply to medical school takes an incredible amount of work and takes time. So you're not going to wake up one day and say, oh, I'm applying tomorrow. Uh, however, there are some things certainly that have affected uh, the numbers. Uh, just uh, general info, the number of allopathic schools, there are 155 currently uh, in the United States, allopathic being the MD programs as opposed to osteopathic being DO programs. 142 of these programs have full LCME accreditation. There are 13 uh, that are either in the preliminary or provisional status. It goes preliminary, provisional, and then full. So there are 13 schools, and that is uh, to meet the position shortage that was calculated uh, several years back, uh, about so a little over 10 years now, where we realized that we were going to be way short um, to accommodate the growth in the population in this country with regard to medical care. So a new wave of schools have, uh, have popped up. We were the 133rd of the 155, and we were the eighth new school in the rollout, but now we're already 11 years in running. So there are those obviously a uh, considerable number who have followed us into this process. Here are some useful websites um, that will uh, help you navigate uh, your path toward medical school. 
Obviously, we highlight some of the uh, studentdoctor.net. Uh, just to give you a little bit about that, you have to be a little bit careful about the information in there, uh, only because um, sometimes uh, that information comes from students. And um, as you can imagine, just make sure that you verify uh, whatever, you, when I say students, meaning the applicants. Just make sure you verify potentially what you're seeing up there is to be true um, with schools or contacts from the schools, uh, just to, to make sure, because there is a little gamesmanship that goes on on these uh, websites, as I'm sure you guys can imagine. Uh, Case Western Reserve actually um, developed a full set of podcasts um, this past um this past cycle, all access admissions, it's called. That's been very helpful and you can go on that. Again, all access admissions, if you listen to podcasts, we're, we have a podcast on there, but many of the medical schools are on there and uh, can give you some further information as well. And then there is also um, accepted.com. And so there are a lot of different resources that are available to you. So a little bit about the troubleshooting on the application. Um, your personal statement. Um, personal statements are important. They, you know, ask the question, oh, with all these thousands of applications, are they read? And the answer is they are. However, if you want to increase the likelihood that yours is read, there are several things that you can do. Um, obviously, choosing the topic. Um, understand, uh, we want to know what, 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 was behind your decision to become a physician. Don't talk in generalities. Um, you know, we know what medicine is about. We want to know how um, uh, the career choice of medicine came to you. So generalities aren't really um, that helpful. The platitudes, the generalities, it's the specifics. You know, what about you? What about your background? What about um, your experiences has led you toward a career in, med in medical school. And you can see here, you know, hardships, challenges, obstacles um, are things that, you know, you may want to uh, put out there. The most important thing is that first sentence, right? It's the hook. You want, you see, we have thousands of applications. Last cycle, we had 6,000 of them. You want to catch the interest of the reader. So you want to start with something that is going to bring them in and basically elaborate on that and uh, build on that hook statement through your personal statement. So good rules of thumb, right? Stick to your theme and support it with specific examples. Write simply, no cliches. Cliches um, are not helpful, uh, should not be used uh, in this process. Uh, try not to use too many words. Obviously, these are common sense kind of things, but you know, speak in plain language. And again, no cliches, no platitudes, no generalities. Um, and I guess, as I say, stay on topic. Don't go wandering away um, and answer. If there are particular questions, obviously answer what is asked of you. Um, again, your unique angle, what makes you you, uh, don't be too self-congratulatory, too self-deprecating. I always say avoid the word, uh, avoid the, the I, right? The I, I, I. I did this, I did that. I call it I-itis. Those essays are not interesting. I, 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 no, 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 okay? So try to avoid the I as much as possible. Medicine is a team game. We want to know and see you as a team player. Um, that's critical. Um, and again, talk about the other. Medicine is all about serving the other, not serving yourself, although there are some benefits to yourself that go along with the career in medicine, but really focus on the other, the subject of your, of your essay, um, and not specifically hyper-focused on yourself. Make sure you have somebody else read your essay. I bring an example of an essay from this past cycle when an applicant in their hook referred to the pandemic beginning in March, 2019. And I reread it about six times and I checked my calendar and I checked and I said, oh no, it's March, 2020 that the pandemic really hit the United States. So again, 
Um, make sure somebody else reads that. You don't want to have an, a, a sort of a blatant error there and, you know, words missing, things like that. And as you get used to your writing and you probably read it six times, your ability to detect those errors may fall away somewhat. And again, uh, review, have somebody else read it. I can't stress that enough. And the other thing that's actually helpful when you're um, reading your essay is read it out loud because when you read it out loud, those errors jump up, okay? So if you're reading it yourself, make sure you read it out loud. Secondaries gives you a little, you know, they give a little bit of an additional information about yourself. Uh, schools will generally uh, try to get you to give something additional to what is in your personal statement. And I would advise you to do that. Try not to include what's in your personal statement in the sec as the topic in your secondary. Give them, uh, give the school some additional in information. And again, uh, try to complement your application without overlapping it, okay? And that's, that's critical as well. There's gonna be a COVID question. Uh, we had one last year. I think over 60% of the schools included some form of COVID question. Many of you who are in college or who are post-college or who are in mass have been impacted by COVID in, or have been sick with COVID yourself. So there's going to be stuff that's related to COVID. So be prepared to have your COVID answer and you'll be able to morph that probably for a lot of different applications. Um, if many of the secondaries may ask you something about their own school and why you're interested in that school. So, you know, be prepared to answer that question, whether it's in an urban environment or a rural environment, whether they have a, a specific focus on research or on community service, whatever it is, you know, you have to sing to the mission of that school. The where do you hope to be in 10 days? You know, uh, 10 days, uh, 10 days that, that I hope to be still alive and, and working. <laughs> no, but 10 years from now, that story is a little different. But um, where you hope to be in 10 years, um, I would be a little humble about that answer only um, in that I think you know, many of you may have an idea of what you want to choose um, to pursue within medicine. But I think um, the humility comes in when you realize there's so much that you haven't been exposed to. And um, it's important that you let the reader know that though these are areas that have um, have ignited your interest, um, you may find things in medical school that you've never come across that may lead you down a different pathway. And I think if you express it that way, it shows that you have thought about potentially what you want to do. But on the other hand, um, you do know that there's a world out there that you've really yet to encounter. And then, you know, um, specific clinical experiences that may that you may have had. Um, types of interviews. Okay, so we're getting drilling this down a little bit. Um, and that's that remember that 13% that I showed you that don't get into medical school. And this may be one of the reasons why. So there's something called the multiple mini interview. Um, and we use the MMI and I'm going to give you a list of all the schools that do use it. Um, and basically, um, the goal of the MMI is to look at the specific competencies uh, that are important in professional development and becoming a physician. Um, the MMI has different scenario stations uh, that are used, and um, you're given two minutes to read the scenario and six minutes to answer a question uh, I'm sorry, six minutes to give the answer to the question that is primarily posed. And many schools, including our own, have follow-up questions to that primary question to sort of enable you to keep that conversation going over the six-minute period of time. There's also something called a behavioral interview. And again, behavioral interviews may ask specific focused type of questions. They may integrate your application into that type of question, questions like the best idea you've ever had, uh, confronting an ethical challenge, um, and how you may have handled it differently. These are all types of behavioral questions that you may be asked. And when we talk about open or closed file, the interviewer may have access to your application or may not have access to your application in that form of interview. 
A panel interview is where you're interviewed by more than one person at that point in time. Those are less common, but they do happen uh, where a mixture of members of the admissions committee may uh, be interviewing you. A little heavy duty stressful there, so not that commonly used. And then there are occasionally group interviews where you sit amongst a group of students and you are interviewed in that process. Again, less common, probably the most uh, common that you're going to encounter are the MMI and the behavioral type of interview process. So here are the schools that are currently using the MMI. There are many. Uh, you can take a snapshot if you want of it and sort of look up and see if uh, any of you probably, if you're applying to medical school in New York, you're going to hit an MMI along the way if you're granted an interview. Many of us in New York do use the MMI. When it says hybrid, that means it's a combination of an MMI and potentially a behavioral or an open room type of interview. So that's that's what the hybrids, when you're seeing the hybrid in parentheses after several of the schools, they're, they're not only using the station approach, but there is station approach in combination with some sort of one-on-one -on -one open interview conversation type. Um, just to bring back uh, sort of what happens at the interview and after, uh, so we talked a little bit about the interview and we'll go back to the virtual interview at the end of the talk here. Uh, try to write a thank you note um, to the, many schools will say they're not necessary. We do understand that they are helpful and many of you wanna feel that you wanna show appreciation to the school for being granted an interview. So try and send them out pretty quickly after your interview. Um, you should have obviously, make sure you know who you're speaking to. Um, I am a physician, so it should be Dr. Rona Waldenberg. Sometimes people see, uh, you know, um, uh, associate dean for mission, and they don't necessarily look up or see that I am, in fact, a physician. I've been, been called Ms. Waldenberg. I've been called Rona. That's not good. Don't do that. You can call me Rona in a casual setting, but don't do that in, uh, in a thank you note to an admissions officer. So make sure you know who you're addressing uh, your, um, your thank you note to, and at the same time, obviously, it should uh, be a thank you specific, if you can refer to something specific from the interview helpful and an appropriate conclusion. Um, letters of intent, we get asked about those. Those really take life, most importantly, in the waitlist process. Um, obviously, if you are hell-bent on going to a school, you can tell them, if you take me, I'm coming, but make sure you're telling the truth, because those things can become uh, can come back to specifically haunt you. Uh, so you see, you know, a statement indicating if accepted, you will attend. And obviously, I would only send that to one school, uh, because if they accept you and they find out you don't attend, uh, and that can be problematic for you in terms of professionalism and going forward. Um, if you have other acceptances, you should mention this. And say, though I have been accepted to other schools, your school remains my first choice. And I would really use that word first choice because it's clear, top, there can be one more than one at the top. So first is, there's only one first. So first choice is correct. Uh, state why you're interested in the school. And obviously uh, it's always important to let the school know what you may bring to the table. So just again, with your application, your achievements, research, medically related experience, community service, these are all things that you should touch upon um, in your application, but the bonus is probably for me the most important and that's what makes you you. Are you into music? Are you into art? Are you an athlete? What, you know, we wanna know sort of what about you is who you are, what you have spent your life devoted to, um, and basically what that commitment entails and how that has um, contributed to your personal development. Those things are vital. So that bonus though last is probably the most important. So make sure that that is highlighted in that application. And if your talents or passions um, direct you and somehow connect you to your research and your medical experiences and your 
community service even better. So that's sort of what you want to construct. Okay, a little bit about us. And this sort of speaks to some of the things that may be helpful when you're looking, given the pandemic, um, uh, for opportunities or potentially opportunities to highlight in your application. We get uh, that question many, many times um, about um, how we, what you can possibly do given the pandemic uh, to demonstrate your interest in medicine. So these are some of the things that our students did um, when they were currently in medical school during the pandemic. I Things that are, um, are timeless and that will not fade away post pandemic are the support of the elderly in your community, tutoring services, shopping, um, even the PPE equipment. Unfortunately, the Delta variant, we don't know where we're going here. We may be coming back to having to wear masks again, to being isolated again. So these are all things that um, potentially will be um, available to you. Scribing, uh, we are not a shadow school. So we do not, we, our dean used to say one hour of, shower, of shadowing is enough. You don't learn uh, how to be a doctor by watching somebody do something. You actually have to engage. And scribing actually is a really good activity. Um, it allows you to engage. It allows you to become an active member of medical care. And that's a particularly good thing to do if you're looking, and, and it's paid. You know, oftentimes the scribing is paid. So for those of you who are looking for a medical experiences, try to try to put yourself in the scribe environment if you're if you're able, because those are, are I think are strong, um, strong opportunities and really show that you have somewhat of an understanding of what is of what medicine is all about. Um, to sort of jump a little bit to uh, post -bac programs, um, there are different types of post -bac programs for those of you who have finished college already or um, weren't necessarily pre-meds or aren't pre-meds currently in college, but are thinking of uh, potentially applying to medicine. So we have what we call career changer programs where you have not uh, basically done pre-med courses in college. And then there are programs called um, career enhancer programs. And those are for students who need a boost. Um, GPA may not be what it should be to be a competitive medical school applicant. Uh, applicant. I refer you guys to the Princeton website here. So again, you can take a picture of that if you want. Um, that is a very helpful site um, and gives you all the different programs uh, that are available in terms of career changer as well as the career enhancer type of programs. And there are other programs in addition that are popping up and uh, some of those involve um, are underrepresented in medicine uh, group. So um, those you can search out separately as well. Uh, those that we're linked to specifically uh, with regard to linkage opportunities, uh, these are programs that we link to. Uh, that means that you can actually apply while you're in the program, uh, potentially get an MCAT wave, depending on what your SAT, ACT score is, um, and not have to skip a year between the post back and entering medical school. Whereas if you go uh, through the regular application pro uh, process, you have to finish the post back, take your MCAT, and then spend a year applying. So when we talk about linkage, those are schools that we link to. The Hunter program is closing, so it is only the Bryn Mawr, Scripps, Goucher, JHU, and Columbia programs. And again, um, there are certain qualifications uh, that uh, require for you to link to our program. And these are career changer programs. These are not the career enhancer programs. Just to sort of show you where we sit um, in the med school hierarchy, and again, this is our current MS1 rising to MS2 class, and our current stats for the incoming class are roughly the same. GPA uh, inched up a little bit to 3.82, uh, but the 517 was the median uh, MCAT uh, and is the median MCAT for our entering class. So uh, given the fact that we're a relatively new school, we sit uh, pretty high up there on the hierarchy. Uh, we're an, an, in uh, a competitive school, but a highly diverse school. And for those of you who follow 
U.S. News and World Report, we actually are the number one school in New York, tied with Columbia, uh, for the most diverse, uh, the most diverse class within, in terms of diversity. So, in terms of diversity of the medical school, we rank number one in New York. So, for those of you who have a potential interest in uh, diversity of environment, that's important. All right, during COVID, so why this increase in application number? So. Um, Medical schools across the country, and I showed you that 18% up across the country. So why is that? And there are a bunch of reasons um, that uh, we can come up with and you talk to people and we all seem to be landing in the same spot here. And that is just, there's been a limit on the gap year opportunities, right? We had students who were going to the Peace Corps. We had students who were doing um, active clinical research and clinical trials. And a lot of these things halted during COVID. And as a result of that, students who may have wanted to take a gap year decided, you know what, I'll just try and apply. So let's see what happens. Uh, if worse comes to worse, I don't get in, I'll reapply. But if they had taken the MCAT and, and obviously had finished the coursework and the requirements, they decided to take a leap. Um, with regard to the Fauci effect, we talk about it in terms of not a split decision to apply to medical school, but more an increased enthusiasm. People wanna get in there right away. Oh, I was gonna do a gap year. I maybe was gonna consider working for some healthcare consulting group or whatever. Nope, I'm jumping right into the pool. Let's go. And that's uh, students who were just enthusiastic and really want to get out there and, and become a part of what has become the biggest healthcare challenge uh, in our lifetime. Um, and then our school specifically, what was going on with us? Um, as many of you may be aware, we were front and center in the pandemic, and I'll give you a little bit more detail on that. Um, the vaccine rollout, the first vaccine was given to a critical care nurse um, at Long Island Jewish, part of the Northwell Health System, first vaccine in the United States. So obviously a lot of publicity and front and center there in terms of the prestige of our institution and having that ability to capture that first vaccine for one of our healthcare workers. Uh, those of you who um, follow Dr. Langer and Dr. Bookfar and your uh, Brain Turns program, there's a whole documentary on them at Lenox Hill, and I'm sure you're familiar with that. And then uh, some other uh, just incidentals and America's Got Talent for those of you who uh, watch that program. We had a group that uh, did quite well uh, in that competition. So um, with regard to Northwell, um, we treated over 100,000 patients between uh, the six-month period of March to Labor Day uh, with regard to the pandemic. We have tiered care at Northwell um, for mild cases on the outpatient level, for moderate to severe cases on the outpatient level, and then uh, obviously, a whole segment of patients that required inpatient care. Uh, one of the first publications uh, regarding COVID and some of the risk factors and the comorbidities came in April 2020 from uh, Northwell, which involved over 5,000 patients. Um, and obviously, um, uh, we provided a lot of information to the country with regard to managing the pandemic. Uh, I mentioned the first vaccine, uh, we were featured on 60 Minutes, and obviously New York was the epicenter and Northwell being the epicenter of that epicenter. And uh, we talked a little bit about uh, the Lenox Hill documentary as well as um, the final episode that was added on, which involved the pandemic and the redeployment of Dr. Langer and Dr. Bookfar and uh, uh, them specifically within the hospital to help with the COVID pandemic. Uh, we talked about this, uh, the incidentals, and that's the Howie Mandel's golden buzzer in America Got Talent. And that was sort of a little cherry on the cake and sort of again, uh, brought us to uh, national attention just given the commitment of this group of nurses uh, to the pandemic as well as highlighting their talents. Now, uh, with regard to the stats, um, and what we mentioned in the COVID year, 91% uh, of the medical schools actually saw an increase, hence that national increase of 18%. Uh, what did that 
require, uh, because of that uh, significant increase, more people to screen the applications. There were more, we interviewed more students as a result of the increase in the application number um, and obviously made more spots available. Our acceptance number was similar. I think a lot of people, a lot of schools were a little bit wary um, about uh, interviewing online and whether students who wouldn't normally show up for an interview because of cost and other things were just taking an interview. So the schools were fairly cautious in terms of um, putting out acceptances just because we were unclear of how uh, COVID would affect the um, process. With our schools specific, specifically, we really didn't find much of a difference. So even though we went on to the virtual platform, our data uh, really was similar in terms of the number of acceptances, wait lists, et cetera, that um, we needed to craft our class. Uh, the fee assistance program, uh, the AAMC spread out um, and increased um, uh, their pool uh, in terms of uh, uh, offering fee assistance. So, uh, and I think they are continuing to do that this year as well. Uh, obviously with more applicants, more interviews, there were more wait list spots. Our class remained uh, the same in terms of its size. Um, so I mentioned about the MCAT and um, still 97% of the applicant pool was able to take the exam. So um, although there were some issues getting it rolled out in a safe way and in a way that would allow us to cover the applicant pool, still 97% able to take the test. Um, there were schools, including ours, that reviewed applications uh, without or prior to receiving an MCAT and about 10% were willing to extend interview invitations without a score. Um, and interestingly, but because of the issues with uh, test centers and whatnot, our school in the past had um, only allowed three years going back in terms of scores. We extended that for students who may have had a score four years prior or something like that to make it a little bit easier. But uh, uh, almost uh, roughly 40% of the schools did not uh, change the range of MCAT dates accepted, et cetera, et cetera, as um, AMCAS uh, was able to offer the test and in a way that most were able to take it. With regard to the secondaries, and I mentioned this earlier as well, just highlighting that um, 70, about 70% 70 of schools have some sort of COVID question that will remain. So um, have your COVID answer ready. Uh, in terms of how COVID may have affected you uh, in whatever way, shape, or form, whether college or opportunities or illness-wise or family members or whatever it may be, uh, have that answer ready. Um, so looking ahead to the current cycle, um, obviously uh, what we did do, uh, many schools, including our own, if Classes were only offered pass-fail, we accepted pass-fail. If you were offered a choice, uh, we didn't necessarily hold it against you that you took it pass-fail, but those who were putting themselves out there and taking, taking a, a class for a grade, that was recognized and, and looked at um, and understood. Again, not necessarily helping or hurting, but just recognizing that an applicant put themselves out there to take uh, a course online uh, for a grade. Um, we do accept online courses, obviously. Uh, the number of hours required for clinical experiences dropped. Uh, all the schools did virtual interviews, um, virtual tours, virtual revisits, um, and basically we utilized the platform to our advantage. Because you didn't have to travel to us, we were able to do, in our school particularly, and some of the others have, I think, leveraged the opportunity as well, not only do one revision, uh, revisit event, but actually do smaller connection events. So we were able to offer more more programming, more information without you having to travel to the school and at the same time be able to ask questions along the way of the decision making, not at some one event very close to the one spot, one school deadline in April. Uh, most schools, including ours, uh, will continue with the virtual interview process with um, 
virtual uh, recruitment interviews, tours, um, and possibly there will be, depending on what happens uh, as we move forward in this COVID environment, for in-person um, visits to the school after um, over the time of the interview season, uh, post acceptance, so students can see the school in person prior to making the decision, but obviously we're gonna be subject to uh, the regulations of the state and of our school specifically, but at least right now that's the plan and many others are following suit. So um, with regard to virtual interviewing, um, just some helpful hints and things you should be mindful of. Make sure you have reliable internet access. Um, make sure your everything is working prior to logging on. Make sure your device is charged. And we strongly recommend not using a phone, but using an iPad or using um, uh, some form of computer, laptop, stationary computer. Um, make sure that the ca camera is at the appropriate level. Um, make sure you know the school's interview process. Are they doing an MMI? Are they doing a behavioral? Are they doing an, a hybrid? And uh, try to get rid of all the background stuff that may interfere uh, with the online interview. Um, with regard to the environment, look at the background. We have had students put some things up there in the background during their virtual interview, which weren't all that appropriate. If you have an animal and you can keep them out of the room, better, best. Uh, we had a student who had a cat jumping on top of them during an interview process. Obviously, some people don't have that space, but if there's some way of keeping your um, animal separate from where you are, that's helpful. Uh, again, things that make sense, but well lit and, you know, make sure that your environment is clean and tidy um, and avoid sitting with a window behind you because that can affect, obviously, the projection into the webcam. Make sure you dress like you are going for the interview. Uh, suit, tie, jacket, uh, dress uh, appropriately. Um, you want the uh, interviewer to know you're taking this seriously. <laughs> and be prepared. Know the school you're going to. Excuse me, take a sip for a second. <coughs> okay. Uh, make sure you know your application. That application is free game for the interview. So we want to make sure that uh, you want to make sure that you're familiar with what you put in there. And uh, also make sure you look at any of the materials that are sent to you in advance from the school. We, we send out a whole bunch of stuff in advance, uh, the tour, um, the introduction to our curriculum, uh, our diversity and inclusion office, our student affairs office uh, sends you information. Just familiarize yourself with those materials. None, none of these, at least from us, are, are that long. Uh, but when, when you interview at a school, you want to let them know that you know what kind of curriculum is being offered. And as schools vary in terms of the curriculum, we all teach the same content, uh, but how we go about teaching it definitely differs from school to school. So uh, with regard to the virtual interview process and what we've learned and many of the other schools have learned as well um, is it allows us to interview a way broader group of applicants. Um, it is obviously a lot easier to log on. Um, you don't have to travel. You don't have to take the time to travel. You don't have to spend the money to travel. Um, it, it, it is incredible and it's incredibly effective. Um, and what we've even heard from some of the pre-med advisors is that because of the virtual interviews, students are able to engage more in activities that may help them actually in their application process because they're not engaging um, and using the time that they need to do to travel and, and, and basically cross the nation uh, to be part of the interview process. Um, obviously, environmental impacts, and I know it doesn't 
necessarily jump out at you, but um, obviously the consumption of fuel and, and, and everything related to that diminishes because, uh, so we like to think that we're doing something good for, for the environment by taking away uh, the need to travel. What are some of the negatives that uh, we've encountered and that we uh, will address and try to address as we move forward in this? Because this may be here to stay uh, in terms of the virtual interview process is obviously the in-person connection falls short. Uh, people do have issues with technology and we have to troubleshoot that as well as issues with the internet, uh, the Zoom fatigue uh, uh, problem, and that's why we send you a lot of information in advance so that you can view it at your own leisure and not have to be on for hours on end and hear people like me talking to you like this for hours and hours on your interview day. So different schools try to get around it differently. And obviously, from the applicant standpoint, you want to try to get exposure to the school, to the culture, to the environment, and uh, that can be difficult to do, though. Uh, in our school and others as well, we do expose you to students during the interview day, either as your interviewers or leading uh, a specific session or being part of a lunch program uh, that we have while we're online. So we're always trying to uh, better ourselves and, um, and try to overcome some of the negatives that go along with the virtual interview. And with that, I am done. Um, I'm hoping, uh, Lisa and Lauren, you can tell me uh, how have we been doing in terms of our questions and answers, and is there anything uh, that particularly you think I should answer over the airwaves? Of course. So the chat has been hopping. We have wow. been this entire hour just typing, typing away. Um, but one thing I think um, that kind of has repeated about COVID um, and if COVID, so one question that somebody posed a couple times was if COVID significantly decreased one's opportunities for direct clinical experience, how should we reflect, explain that in the application? Should we try to be stronger in other areas to compensate for it? Okay, so firstly, I'm trying to get myself on here. So that <laughs> I'm trying to exit out of this uh, presentation, but you, you hear me, do you see me too, Lisa, or no? can see you, but you can probably stop sharing your screen and then. Okay, we'll try, we'll try and do that and we'll see what happens. But um, okay, um, at any rate, and you see my screen share, right? Stop, yeah. share, there okay, here I am. Okay, hey, hey, okay. Um, so, I, you know, I think, as I said, there are opportunities probably in the application to talk about, um, how COVID has impacted your application. So obviously that may be a space where would you, you would want to say, I had hoped to do an X uh, and had lined up this experience or had trouble finding the experience given the limitations of COVID. But because of COVID, I was able to, or I chose to contact trace uh, be a, you know, be a tutor, uh, you know, volunteer for the elderly in my community. So you will, I, I think it's fair to say that. And I think if you put that forward, um, I think that medical schools understand what environment you are coming out of and will certainly adjust their expectations. I know we certainly did, you know, um, in terms of what was available to students and how they address that. And in, in truth, it's the one who, the ones who sort of were creative in their applications, who doing what Ashley's doing, now I'm teasing, but you know, you know, or engaging in the brain turn program, which is a brilliant idea of all of you to have because you're taking advantage of a virtual online resource. And there's no reason why not to put that in the essay. My exposure to clinical medicine was limited, but I was able to participate in the brain turn program. And I saw Dr. Asaf Harrell talk all about MS. And I learned, you know, there you go. You have your, don't all 800 and some odd of you who are still on here do that. That may not be the best idea, but, you know, be a little creative with it. And I think you'll, you'll be able to navigate that question and it won't be an issue for you. And then there was also another one that um, somebody specifically asked, can this question please be directed towards Dr. Waldenberg? Uh, as in hardships, is it okay to talk about mental health struggles in the personal statement? Would that lead to a rejection? 
you have to be careful. Uh, I will say that. Um, you know, less is more in uh, is what I like to say. Um, I, it's com it's a complicated answer. I think if if the issue has been resolved, okay. So if you've had um, the struggle and you are currently functioning well, have overcome it, whether it with medication or therapy or both, and you have demonstrated in your application, maybe you needed to leave school for a while, but were able to come back and finish and you can prove in your application that it's all going okay now, I think it's okay. Um, the last thing, well, I shouldn't say the last thing, but it, it gets a little bit more complicated if you're currently going through those struggles and, um, and schools may not look at that as, not, not that they won't look at it as, at, as sympathetically, but it may be a little bit more complicated in terms of the school's response. So for those things that you've been through that you have overcome, go even better. It shows you're resilient. I mean, you saw in a lot of the questions that we put up there, schools want to know you're resilient, that you can bounce, that you can, you know, you have a challenge, hardship, financial, academic, um, um, you know, health related, whether it's mental health, whatever, they want to know that you you have an ability to bounce. So if you can show that, no issue. Okay, so I hope that answered your question. Okay, Ashley, I know we're, we're on time here. So because it's 1159. So um, I know there have been such great, great, great questions. Uh, so what I can do is put our email address, our office email. I can pop it in the chat. If anybody has any other questions, uh, you can most certainly uh, reach out to us. Great. Thanks, Lisa and Lauren and uh, Ashley. Thank you for inviting us. And I hope uh, we provided some updated information. Um, sort of what the complexion is now. It's competitive and looking at the numbers coming in uh, for us this cycle, which we're monitoring as we go, number, numbers are up. So um, it's competitive. So uh, last word of advice, play offense, not defense. Okay, so I always tell applicants that don't highlight your deficiencies. Okay, don't, you know, try and spin positive. So you know, we talk about students who maybe got a, a grade less than they wanted, but were going through a difficulty at the time. I always tell, if you're going to put that example in your application, you say, but I finished, okay? But I didn't quit. I didn't withdraw. Um, I, I felt it was important for myself to reach my personal goals. So though I may not have gotten the A, I got a B. And you know what? That B is okay with me, given the circumstances that I'm in. Because in your careers in medicine, you are going to come across challenges. And you can't put those careers on hold and say, oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm withdrawing for now. And I'm going to deal with my personal problems. Sometimes, obviously, the personal issues are so great that you have to do that. But for the most part, some of the more routine challenges that you have in your day-to-day -day life, you got to keep going. So the fact that you can spin it in such a way that I finished, I, I, I finished on time, I, fin I finished the course. Again, I, I, the second part of the course, I did so much better. All of those things sort of, again, speak to that ability to handle failure. To ha we, we want you to be able to handle failure. We, we don't wanna see perfect people. If we see perfect people, we get nervous because you're gonna fail. In medicine, you are going to fail. You're gonna fail, you're gonna lose patience, you're gonna make mistakes, you're gonna make mistakes that have dire consequences, you have to learn to live with that. Okay, so if you can't handle getting a B in orgo, what's the likelihood that even a C in orgo, and one C is not gonna kill you, if you can't handle getting a C in orgo, what's the likelihood that you're gonna be able to handle a mistake that you made that had a devastating impact on a patient, right? Now, hopefully you'll learn to do that over time, and that's one of the things you learn in medical school is a professionalism component, but Obviously, we want you know we want to know that 
you can handle disappointment, what you learn from that, how you build yourself. You know, many students talk about that. I, I was such a grade A student and I took the first orgo exam and I got a D and how, oh my God, I thought I was a genius and here I'm an idiot and how am I going to fix that? And yeah, but the strategies, right? They change their strategy and, and that we love to see that. That's, that's perfect. That, that works. Okay. Play offense. Don't play defense. Don't play defense. I got to be because I broke my ankle. I got to be or see because my cat was sick. Don't do that. Okay. Don't do that. Do it in a positive way. I got to be, I broke my ankle, but I finished. I was able, I missed three weeks of the course, but I finished. That's better. Thank Good. you, Dr. Goldenberg. Yes, thank you. I think uh, Dr. Wiley, who spoke to us last week, had a similar thing with like, don't play defense, play offense. Like, what did you learn from it? How are you right. different now? That kind of thing. Like, it's okay to mess up, but how do you respond to that? Um, and and you don't blame it on somebody else. <laughs> that's, that's never the right answer, Ashley, right? Yeah, exactly. Yes. It's, yeah, it's something you have to like reflect on and Take responsibility. You have to take responsibility for your mistakes, your missteps, your lackluster performance, whatever those things are. You got to take responsibility for them and fix it and fix it. And that's what we all do. That's what we do in medicine too. You know, I make a mistake. Well, I'll never make that. You remember your mistakes. You don't remember necessarily all the good stuff. You remember the bad stuff. Why do you remember the bad stuff? Because you correct that, right? You, you focus on it and you correct yeah, even Mr. Dowling also had a similar thing. Like everyone's definitely on the same page here about like you learn from your failures and stuff like that. Um, Absolutely. So, so grateful to have you here. Thank you for taking the time to speak with everybody. Uh, a lot of people found this so helpful and inspirational. And I think that it'll be put to great use. <laughs> that we oh, have great. Great. Well, please, you know, uh, uh, Lisa, Lauren uh, are, are available in our office. Um, as uh, Lisa mentioned, our email is up. Um, if there are questions that we were not able to answer, and I know those guys are fast typists because they type a lot and are, we're do, we do this a lot, but please feel free to reach out and uh, we'll try to get answers to you um, as best as we can. And, and good luck to everyone. And again, congratulations. I, I see David Langer on here. So uh, I, ha I don't know if he's still there, but um, Dr. Langer and his group and, you know, doing this, I think, as I said, this is a, I, I recommend anybody who's potentially applying to medical school, join this program because um, we're thinking about applying because there's so much good information here that you're providing in so many different ways, right? From hard science to, you know, admission strategies, you know, you get a wealth of information here and you guys are really doing a tremendous service. So thank you uh, thank so you much for that. all you're yeah. doing. That's the goal is to be able to give these resources to as many people as possible. It's an entirely free program and we want as many people involved and to be able to benefit from this kind of thing. And that's why we're so appreciative to people like you who come on and help us out. And thank you, Lisa and Lauren. I know you guys were responding to questions the entire time. <laughs>